Welcome to Pete's Property Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Buyers and hosted by Pete Wargent, buyers agent, finance and real estate expert, and all-round property guru, plus published author. Join Pete for 30 minutes as he chats all things property with a new guest each week. Learn practical tips from the movers and shakers in the property industry and well-known personalities sharing their property journeys. G'day, welcome to this week's episode of the Pete Wardian Property Pod. I'm thrilled today to have a very special guest on the pod, Mr. Peter Meek, formerly Managing Director of Chobani in Australia and a seasoned property investor. Peter, how did I go with the intro there? Yeah, it's spot, spot on, Pete. That's me. <laughs> yeah, Peter, he called me out for saying I have the same introduction every week and call everybody a very special guest. So uh, I was feeling a bit of pressure there and uh, didn't want to undersell you. So, uh, Peter, for those people who are not familiar, tell us a bit about your background. Where do you come from originally? Where did you grow up and so on? So like you, Pete, from the UK originally, from Gloucestershire in the southwest, got two brothers, our family, when I was growing up as a kid, we were, my dad was a bit of an entre- serial entrepreneur. We we owned um, a fish and chip shop. We had a milk round. We ended up selling poultry. And and it was quite a dynamic lifestyle because we, we were always seeing lots of new things. But uh, unfortunately, like happens with so many uh, entrepreneurs, me, you know, my dad hit a really rough patch when I was 16. And we went bankrupt. So I learned some really valuable lessons then. That was like a, almost like a reset. So the first 16 years were plain sailing from 16 onwards. You know, it was quite tough. So, uh, yeah, uh, you've never lost the, the Gloucester accent there, have you? It's, it's stuck with you <laughs> despite all of these years in Australia. I was thinking uh, for Australian to grapple with uh, UK dialect, uh, Gloucester accent is pretty easy to do you just basically talk like a pirate and uh, <laughs> make jokes about inbreeding and you've pretty much got it down pat. So, yeah. uh, so I mean it's, it's a nice part of the country though I'm very popular now uh, particularly through the past couple of years I think a lot of people have moved out of London through the Cotswolds and out to those parts of the country so a good upbringing but you said some challenges um, as you got into your teenage years was, was that related to family business? Yeah, so the, my dad's business went bankrupt. It had a dramatic effect on us. You know, we basically had to sell all of our assets. It, it quite frankly, my dad ill, Peter. You know, he the stress of it, not being able to provide for his family, and ultimately, I think, killed him. Uh, and that had quite a traumatic impact on my outlook on life. You know, growing up, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but having seen literally you know, the demise of my dad, I thought, well, no, I'm going to go a different path. So I ended up going into the corporate world, which um, which was which was a lot more secure. You know, so first job was uh, working for Unilever, making ice cream. You know, that was a pretty cool job, actually. I can, I can, one of the probably few people around the world that can make a Viennetta by hand. So there's a useful skill that has never come in handy since I left. But I did that for about seven years. And really enjoyed it, but found that because I didn't have a degree, I couldn't get on. Uh, so you know, I got really frustrated, quite frankly, couldn't progress. So basically got educated at night school and then went to university and basically joined Nestle when I was about 25. And a big tipping point for us was um, we got offered an opportunity to go and work in Croydon, like the ass end of the UK. Hey, I've got um, a property pro- in Croydon. Uh, <laughs> well, editor, we'll have to uh, we'll have to rephrase that. It's a, it's an up and coming and hi- highly uh, highly popular gentrifying location in London. <laughs> so, so we we obviously went and explored Croydon and saw the great points that Pete's talking about. But the other opportunity was to move to Australia. To head up the marketing for Peter's ice cream, so yeah, it was named. The business was named after me, and I thought, well, that's got to be all right. So I moved to Australia with Joe, my wife, uh, in two thousand. Basically, worked in that business for a few years and ended up running the business, uh, which was amazing, right? So came here within three years. I'm running, you know, a three hundred million dollar business. So it sounds like um, because of what happened um, with the family business that. 
um, it sounds as though that pointed you towards a more stable career in paid employment, I guess. So you had the stability of the paycheck, uh, but and also some drive to work your way up through the ranks. Um, I remember as a kid, we used to drive living in Yorkshire and you'd drive past like the round tree factory. And we used to say, imagine working there. You could like you could li- you could eat all of the the lollies and the sweets and the ice creams that you want. But my dad used to say, oh yeah, but after two or three days people get sick of it. Is that how it works out? Well after two or three decades, Pete, I'm still pretty <laughs> much loving ice cream. So you definitely don't eat as much uh as you do at the start. But yeah, and having the security of a job was really important, but I was still very driven by financial security. So I worked my backside off to progress, you know, and I would take on whatever I needed to do to move ahead, you know. So, so, so was it the it was the Nestle role that actually brought you uh, to the Antipodes in the first place? Then, yeah. So got transferred with with Nestle into Nestle Peters and. Mm-hmm. That was a great business and they make great products. And literally, if you said, oh, I work for an ice cream company, no one ever reacts negatively to that. <laughs> like it's the most exciting category. And marketing ice cream to Australians where the sun shines most of the year is a lot easier than marketing ice cream to the Brits where the sun pretty much never shines. So it just felt like a really good opportunity and it was. Obviously, that's a that's a huge global conglomerate. How did you get along working for the big corporate machine like uh, Nestle Peters? You do become a part of a big system and you spend a lot of time managing, yeah, they call it a matrix structure, but it's basically managing sideways, managing down and managing up. And that's that takes a lot of time and energy. At the time, you don't realise it, but now when I look back, you know, I spent far too much time worrying about what people thought than not enough time worrying about what the business was doing. Uh, and I think that probably happens in lots of corporations. Uh, but I was working really hard. I was doing 60-hour weeks was a, a good week, you know, and most weeks I was much more than that. It was it was, it was was a lot because managing all those touch points was very challenging. Yeah, and um, I think uh, one of the so, – so my experience of um, the corporate world is a bit like – you have some success, then you get promoted, then you have some success, then you get promoted, and you effectively keep keep on getting pushed through the system, working harder and harder until you reach a position which is either overwhelming or too much or you're not qualified for. Or some, you, know, you basically you keep on going until a breaking point. And obviously at some point you, you were spat out of the system. It, it, what was it that caused you to leave? Was it the long hours? or? Yeah, well, look... It- I left mainly because I was given, you know, the business that I was running did really well for my first couple of years of leadership. And then the third year, we had a really tough year, you know, and a big part of it probably due to my leadership or I take responsibility for that, but a bit of bad luck. And Nestle gave us the opportunity to move to North Africa uh, or or leave. And it had taken 10 years to get Joe uh, happy with living in Australia. So I couldn't go to North Africa. So we stepped out and, I had to recover from that. And yeah, there was a quite a few war wounds, you know, because you get in corporate world, your your confidence and your energy level is often linked to how the business is performing. But actually, you have to work out how you can decouple yourself from that because if your energy levels, you know, are linked to the business performance, when the business is doing really well, you're overly optimistic. And when the business isn't performing well, then you're overly pessimistic. And Actually, you need to be objective on either side. Yeah, see, it comes back to that old thing, isn't it? Control the controllables, and it's it's the same if you invest in the stock market. You know, the market's going to go up and down, regardless of anything that you do. But you've got to focus on the process and doing the best thing, the best that you can, because sometimes those outcomes are beyond your control. So I mentioned at the outset, you ended up at um, Chibani. So tell us a little bit about um, Chibani and, and that journey. That was a gift. That was sort of three or four years after I finished at uh, Nestle Peters. And it's my second leadership role. And Chibani is an American business owned by a Turkish immigrant guy called Hamdi Ulukaya. And amazing story. Went from nothing to a billion dollars in the US making Greek yogurt. And everyone said to him, you were lucky. Could never happen again. Yeah, the big guys were asleep. And 
he bought a little business in Australia in 2011 and, and you know, and put me in to run it. And we went from $40 million to $250 million in, in nine years. And Chaban is now the number one brand. And what was really great about Hamdi and that corporate role is the fact that he believed in a bigger purpose. You know, yes, we needed to create profits because profit's a bit like breathing. Without any breath, you sort of fall over pretty quickly. But it was to a point, you know, and he invested in his people. He invested in his community. We invested with our consumers and our customers and, you know, making sure that we were doing the best job that we can in all of those areas meant that the business really thrived and really reinforced that doing good can be good business. And funnily enough, Pete, you mentioned uh, round trees. You know, it's almost like come full circle to these Quaker type businesses hundreds of years ago. That's Hamdi's philosophy: you know, giving back and making a difference to your people will ultimately build you a great business, and that's proved to be the case. And uh, I did that for nine years, and you know, really loved. He's you know, an inspirational guy. I love working for him. Love the people that I work with. But it's 2019. My mum started to get or started she has on early onset dementia and wanted to spend more time with her and so took a really difficult decision to move you know to leave probably i suspect one of the best you know ceo roles certainly in the food industry because you're working for an amazing guy but decided to take a couple of years off to spend time back in the uk and go travel it not great timing with covid coming along but you know, that was, that was what we did. And we did get back to the UK, which was really cool. You know, my experience working in, in the corporate world has really helped a, a lot in terms of our, our property investment journeys. Yes, and we'll, we'll come on to that very shortly. We, we were um, chatting just before we hit record. So one of the things that I guess would be familiar to anyone who started a business or run a business or uh, been an entrepreneur or a property investor is you're going to get those ups and downs along the way. And one of the interesting things you said there just before is that if you hadn't um, had the experience at Nestle Peters and stepped out of that business, then you would never have got the opportunity to take Chobani from a startup to a market-leading brand. So when we go down to Woolies today, the kids see Chobani produce all the way along the shelves. And as you said, that's basically a gift because when you get a setback, um, it kind of, in one way or another, it forces you to take some action or go take a different path. So um, I'm sure that's a familiar point to a lot of people. Um, so obviously, Chabani was a tremendous uh, success. Now, you mentioned at the beginning there, financial security was a key uh, motivation for you uh, from your teenage years onwards. Um, obviously, doing managing director roles you earned some good income. Tell us a bit about your investment journey and the ups and downs along the way there. Yes, sir, and really good income. But because I was so busy trying to be a great corporate executive, I spent very little time managing that. I abdicated all of the responsibility to financial advisors who I'm sure had the best intent for me, but we ended up being very highly leveraged in some what turned out to be very speculative products in in the 2008 crash and we really got we really got hurt so and um, we sort of came out of 2008 sort of minus several hundred thousand dollars in equity you know so that was a tough lesson but it's actually the same lesson that i learned in corporate world is you know if if you don't if you don't understand what you're doing in some areas then things are going to go wrong so um that was really tough, but the good news for us was what you know, 2009 we had negative equity. We still owned a house, but you know what we we ended up doing was decided to downsize. So we downsized that house, paid off a lot of the debt. We still had some debt, but we said, okay, well, abdicating responsibility to other people hasn't worked. We need to take a much more involved role in terms of our wealth creation that's what we've done and that's actually a gift right we've now educated ourselves so that you know over the next decade we've managed to dig ourselves out of a hole and get ourselves into a really good financial position do you want to save on buyers agent fees you could save thousands with buyers buyers 
as Australia's most extensive network of buyers' agents, we can lock in highly competitive prices. Plus, our national network of buyers' agents are some of the best in the business. So get the buyer's buyer's advantage and talk to us today. Call 1-800-975-051 or visit buyersbuyers.com.au. A lot of those geared products, um, well, I guess it's obvious in hindsight, right, but they, there were more hidden risks than sometimes um, the people promoting them let on. But um, when you got to that position in 2009, you obviously um, said about making a plan to uh, to go from where you were then, sort of financial security, where you've got to today. So what, what was the plan and how did you even go about formulating a plan? Well, the first part of the plan was to say, okay, well, how can we create big lumps of equity to sort of dig us out of the hole? And how can we do it in a way that's low risk? And I'd always remember my dad saying safe as houses and property seem like the most obvious place to do it. And actually, certainly as a product, much easier to understand than some the other investments at that point so we basically spent the next couple of years educating ourselves we read a lot of books we met a lot of people we're very lucky we met jane slack smith very early on in our uh, property journey and she was brilliant in terms of education and she's still our mortgage broker today and that's when we started investing property we did her course which is all about buy renovate refinance repeat and um, we, yeah, that that's been our core cool strategy. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, regular listeners will know Jane was on the show, and um, I think we probably cut half of the content out because uh, uh, Jane could talk all day about property <laughs> strategies in terms of um, how to finance it, how to renovate. So, as you mentioned, Jane has a what she calls a trident strategy. There, so you you buy properties below market value, you find properties you can add value to through renovation. And then you refinance them and off you go again. Um, so is that more or less what your approach was, just to try and add a property each year until you uh, built a substantial portfolio? That's exactly what we did, Pete. We downsized. We bought a property that needed a bit of cosmetic work. We renovated that property, created some equity. We are able to draw out that equity and buy our first investment property. And Literally moving forward, our plan was to buy a property every year for uh, up to 10 years. And that's pretty much, I think we ended up with nine properties over nine years and we renovated the first three. And yeah, with the refinancing, that gave us enough equity to to buy the other properties and also have financial buffers, which for me was really important because of this, this fear of, you know, of not being able to survive a, a significant downturn from my dad and certainly what had happened in the the GFC. And that strategy has worked really well. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, spectacular results, actually. Even, you know, over the course of what, you know, it's, it's only really a dozen years since the financial crisis, 12 or 13 years. Um, a few um, uh, sort of echoes there of, um, of our approach, really. Um, different motivation, I think, in our case. My wife and I had... A few properties, uh, partly because um, we owned a property each, and then we'd bought one together. But it was the same thing, really. We just sat down and thought, well, we can't. In our case, we just couldn't uh, face the prospect of the corporate world for another thirty years, and uh, we just uh, it was as simple as that. Heather said, "Well, let's try and buy ten properties in ten years." Now, as it turned out, it actually took us a bit longer than ten years, and not everything works out as you expect. But uh, I think. Um, you know, the key lesson or takeaway there, I think, is, and I see this all the time with young people, that people massively overestimate what they can do in a year, hence the popularity of things like cryptocurrencies and leverage bets and staking and all the other stuff that people are doing, gambling on NFTs. But they hugely underestimate what they can do in 10 or 12 years, as you've uh, perfectly shown, just with a very simple strategy, buying property, renovating and add, adding value, focusing on quality over quantity. And, um, well, I mean, it's it really the results you've achieved are inspirational over that period of time. So you're in a different position today then. So 
you've got financial security, but is the goal now, as I understand it, you're transitioning from the equity phase uh, through to generating cash flow. So how did you decide to go about that? And what are some of the key strategies that you're going to use? We decided to go traveling and spend time in 2020 in the UK and we were going to just use equity that we created. Yeah. So we have all these buffers. We're going to run some of that down because our portfolio, whilst it generated a little bit of cash flow, it, it wasn't enough. Uh, and we got to the UK and we thought we can't do any traveling because of COVID. What can we do? Let, let's, let's educate ourselves now about better cash flowing strategies. And the first part of working out how much cash flow do you need is what's your number? You know, so we literally sat down and said, okay, living in the UK, this is how much cash flow we need to live on. Uh, and then when we need, move back to Australia, this is how much cash flow we're going to need to be, you know, earning here. So we basically spent the last couple of years investing in the UK in much higher cash flowing assets, property assets, which has been great because we've, we've learned a great deal. But it actually also means that as the cash flow increases, the need to do, certainly the need to go back to the corporate job, it's not there. And that's massive comfort for me and my wife, Jo. And yeah, we're really excited. And the cash flow just, you work once and get paid forever. I think that's what's the great thing about property, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you buy well, then you you get capital growth and uh, potentially the cash flow as well. Now, I was actually invited on a podcast um, recently because I, like yourself, I've got uh, a property portfolio in the UK and it it actually made me realise just how different UK property is, just thinking through the questions for this podcast in terms of the financing, the strategies that people use. As you mentioned, one of the things that draws people over there, and it's not for everybody, is the potential to generate a much stronger cash flow either from renting out properties by the room in sort of houses of multiple occupancy, which are, I guess are a bit like the boarding house approach in Australia, or alternatively from holiday lets or serviced accommodation where you can, you're effectively renting property by the day. So I know this is something you've spent a lot of time over the past year or two getting educated on and putting into practice. So uh, what are a couple of the key strategies you've used over there? Well, again, it, it started with education, Pete. You know, we got, you know, we we did a, a training program that sort of covered all these areas. And yes, we, you know, we've got a couple of HMOs now where we're renting out by the, the room and they're really beautiful, right? They're all en suite. It's like a, imagine a mini Hilton hotel room with a shared kitchen and sitting area where you know you can spend time socializing with your friend it's a really good product but you basically deliver to the end user a, a, a cheaper product because you know we pay all of their the internet the heating the cooling everything and but what you get in return is instead of getting one rent you get five rents from a house albeit at a lower level and the net cash flow you know the gross yield on those properties is sort of 15 percent and even after you've paid all of the running costs of the property managers, the, the cost of running the house and your mortgage payments, we're still left with sort of five or six percent literally net yield, which is really strong. And we've worked out that we actually don't need if we buy one of those every two years for the next six years, you know, that makes a big difference to our, our you know, our, our, our cash flow. And the other strategy running parallel with this is holiday lets. We've bought a beautiful Victorian townhouse in York that was on one title, but it's got five flats. So we basically have got the ability to split that into five titles at some point in the future, which creates a lot of equity in itself. But what we're actually doing is converted, we've converted it into very high-end holiday lets. And similarly, the cash flow on that is even higher actually than the HMO. So by doing one of you know one HMO every two years and one holiday let every two years, we get to comfortably our you know our our, our freedom number in terms of cash flow. Yeah, I mean it's uh, I guess one of the beautiful things about the the serviced accommodation or holiday let is that um, each time the property is let out, it has to be restored into top notch condition. So um, you don't end up with uh, some of 
sometimes you find with rental properties, especially if the landlord is traveling, is that the place can get run down. <laughs> but obviously that doesn't happen with a holiday let. And um, with so many Brits choosing to holiday at home now with the difficulties of traveling and the cost of it, I mean, it's a, it's been an absolutely amazing time for people wanting to gener- generate cash flow from those types of assets. And no doubt that will continue with the cost of living crisis in the UK. I think a lot of people are holidaying domestically. Um, interesting insights, actually, on our portfolio. We, two or three years ago, we bought a, a Victorian terrace in a place called Headingley, which cricket fans would know, uh, in Leeds. Beautiful Victorian terrace, which was four bedrooms and a basement. I mean, it has all the potential to be an HMO property, but at this point, we don't need the cash flow. And actually, managing uh, five separate rentals is not on my to do list living in Noosa, but it is something that could be converted to cash flow down the track. So it's one of the things that people can do who are thinking about setting up a retirement portfolio is buy a property that's just a single buy to let property today, but it's got potential to turn into cash flow down the track. I guess this is um, investing overseas is not something that's for everybody, Peter. Um, I guess the the benefit for people like you and I who spend time in Europe is it's diversification. You can maybe use some uh, currency arbitrage to benefit from movements in foreign currency, but it does come with some of its own challenges as well. Um, Can Aussies invest overseas these days, do you think? And if so, what should they do as a first step? Is it mainly education? I think you can, absolutely, you can invest overseas, but I think it is education and it's finding people that you know, like and trust in those areas where you want to invest. I think it would be very difficult to manage yeah, this remotely, but all of our property investing in the UK we've done as part of limited companies with joint venture partners, and they're based in the UK, so they're the people on the ground. So that's how we've overcome that challenge. But in theory, if you can if you can find the right people in those markets, then you can do it. And there are a lot lots of people in the UK that will provide this service. You just obviously have to do very stringent due, due diligence. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? If you're not familiar with the local market, you've either got to you've got to find some people to work with who you trust. And as you know, the the the, the investing model is actually quite different over there. They don't the buyer's agency model very different with deal sourcing, financing can be very different. Um, sometimes better, but not always. And uh, the tyranny of distance comes in to play. A little bit as well. So, um, so what do you think? What does the end game look like for you? You're going to be uh, based back in Europe, uh, but living off the cash flow from your property portfolio by the sound of it. Oh, well, the big decision for us, Pete, is actually ultimately where do we want to retire? And we've got we've got six years to make that decision. Yeah, you know, we're we're still going to keep our property portfolio in Australia. We're going to build a property portfolio, a bigger property portfolio in the UK. We're going to spend time in both countries. I'm enjoying doing some sort of consulting to businesses. So I've got other stuff that I can do, but you know, we'll look forward to making Joe and my wife, Joe and I will sit down and have a nice glass of wine and decide, or well, ultimately where do we want to finally turn up our toes? You know, that was what the accountant said to us. He said, Oh, you've only got to answer one question. I thought, Oh, this is going to be a great question. And the question was, where do you want to die? Uh, (laughs) to put a cheerful (laughs) twist on it (laughs) like a good accountant should but it's the right question we haven't made that decision yet but we'll make that probably in about five or six years time but in the meantime we're going to build assets and cash flow in both countries yeah lots of parallels with us i guess the one thing um with us is um just inheritance tax in the uk is more punitive and it's just something we have to think about a little bit because um, I, I guess our kids uh, are doing their schooling in Australia and um, yeah, they, they don't have the same death taxes over here. But um, yeah, look, I guess you know, life uh, will uh, do what it does and things will uh, work themselves out over time. But uh, as you've uh, perfectly shown, the key is to grow the portfolio so you've got those choices in the first place. Uh, Pete, I just, um, when we were going through today's interview, fascinating stuff. I, I just jotted down a few notes because I, uh, when you get uh, people who've been through so much experience as you have, I try and sort of tease out some of the key lessons or learnings, as people like to say these days. I've got kind of four things that I've jotted down, but I'd be interested to get your take on it. 
I think the first thing there was this um, concept that uh, I think somebody came up with in the 1960s. It was it was tongue in cheek, right? The idea of the Peter Principle, but the basic idea is as you go through your corporate career, at some point, if you keep getting promoted, you're gonna you're gonna hit a roadblock or a, a challenging period. Um, and it sounds like you know you had that, but I, so I guess that was the first point: is that it's it's rarely a smooth journey to success, even for the most talented of people in um, corporate or executive world. But I, I think the second thing, as you as you pointed out, there is firstly the fortunes of the business. Uh, you shouldn't allow that to dictate necessarily your self worth, because every business goes through cycles, and some of that's outside of your control. But as you said, that can actually be a gift sometimes because that opened up the new doors and ultimately to your, the, I suppose, probably the pinnacle of your career at Chobani, growing effectively a startup into a brand leader. And I think on the investing side, I suppose the two key takeaways I got there is one, get educated because then you can take personal responsibility instead of outsourcing to financial advisors or well-meaning uh, friends and family. And the fourth thing, I guess, um, which is a recurring theme, I think, is that people always seem to massively overestimate what they can do in the short term, but hugely underestimate what they can achieve over a decade or more. So look, those are the key lessons that I took away, but is, is there anything I've missed? No, I look, I think you're right, Pete. The Peter principle, you rise to a level of incompetence. But I didn't want to say incompetence, Pete, because I know you're a very no, competent man, but I, I, but, I think but, the, the point but, being but that... It's not going to be a smooth career because somebody who excels at, at one role needn't it would needn't necessarily translate to the next role that you take because it's almost by definition going to be a different job, right? Well, but the thing the thing was, Pete, you learn you learn more from failure than you learn from success. So actually, the failure at Peter's was the gifts that meant that. I was a much better leader at Chobani and built a much better business. So, and I wouldn't have done that if that had been my first leadership gig. Uh, and I think the point around getting educated, don't invest in things that you don't understand, and take a long-term view. You know, if we've done all this in the last ten years, I'm 55 now. But imagine if I'd started when I was 25. You know, it would have been incredible. And so, I think get educated is invest. It's the best investment you can make is in yourself, and that's been the key learning. Yeah, I think, um, and I think for people in, interested in property investment, let me finish with a cricket analogy. There was this thing with um, Queensland cricket, and they, they had this uh, real bogeyman. They, they'd never won the Sheffield Shield, and every year it was like, right, how are we going to win the Sheffield Shield this year? Right, let's hire Graham Hick. He's going to win us the Sheffield Shield, and then the next year, oh, let's get Ian Botham. He's the guy. He's going to win the Sheffield Shield for us. And it was, I think it was Alan Border who, who said in one of his books, he's like, well, hang on a sec. Why don't we make a plan to win the Sheffield Shield in 10 years from now and build towards that? And that that is, as you've perfectly demonstrated, if you go about thinking about your property investing like that, how can we make a plan to be successful and build a portfolio over 10 years instead of trying to do everything now because it's it's such an easy trap and it's very tempting of course when you're young because you're impatient um you know you've got less to lose in a sense but as you've shown um if you can just build a simple plan even as you said just buy one property a year and renovate when you can afford to uh, you can achieve very powerful things through compounding yeah that's spot on pete so true Hey, thanks uh, very much. Uh, before I go, for people who are interested in finding out more about things like HMOs or investing overseas in the UK or cash flowing assets over there, I mean, uh, you're not going to get all your answers from one podcast. That's one of the things I, I've learned, um, especially in terms of things like tax advice and financing. But are there any good resources that people can check out just to give them a flavour of what might be possible and just to, as you said, get educated. Yeah, there's some great resources about UK property investment. There's a there's a really good, it's a bit like property chat over here. It's called propertytribes.com, yeah, where lots of investors are on there and there's a lot of um, a lot of knowledge shared there. But they're also a bit like here, there's some great podcasts. Simon Zucci's got a really good podcast. There's also uh, Rob Dix has got a really great podcast. 
it's basically a lot of the same education tools that you've got here. And anyone can drop me a note on LinkedIn and happy to have a, the one gift about property is you've got time, happy to have a coffee, a virtual coffee with people if they want to know a bit more about the UK market and some of the stuff that we've done. It's it's nice to be able to help other people on their journey because we, we had a lot of help along the way, which made a big difference. So there you go. If you're um, interested to learn more, um, you can have a virtual ice cream or coffee uh, with Peter <laughs> on uh, LinkedIn or hook up online. Uh, Pete, thanks uh, so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to learn uh, some of those uh, key lessons and uh, look forward to chatting again in due course. Cheers, Pete. Thanks for listening to Pete's Property Podcast, powered by Buyers Buyers. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time as Pete chats all things property with a new guest. And just a reminder that the information provided in this podcast is general advice only and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation or needs. You should always consult a licensed professional to discuss your individual personal circumstances.